Take your Bibles, would you please, to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings, please, is where we find ourselves this morning. We're considering the life of Elijah, and I have got only about an hour here, and I want to get as much in here as I can. No, I've got about an hour's worth of preaching in 20 minutes here, so you uh, bear with me. I think we'll just kind of cut it short and come back tonight to some things that we'll look at here today. I think it's very fitting where we're at here in the life of Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 21, please look with me, and I'll read for us beginning in verse 8. The Bible says, And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard that I might have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. But Jezebel his wife came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? He said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel his wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be married. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. This is an amazing situation here of the strength and the courage of one man versus the lust and the oh, desire to have of another, and then the inner workings of of a wicked queen. For time's sake today, I'll introduce you to a couple of characters, one in particular, and we'll draw from that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, could we? Father in heaven, we come to you now, desiring to hear from you, expecting that from your word that it is put out, it will not return void. We've recognized today these men and ladies who have served and continue to serve on our behalf. We would ask today that they would feel honored and recognized. And then, Lord, as we consider the testimony of Naboth, may we be inspired as well to stand. We ask now these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at the life of Elijah, and for time's sake, very quick review. Elijah is the prophet that God raised up in a very difficult time in the nation of Israel. Israel is just 58 years removed from the pinnacle of their glory. Solomon as their king and people coming from all around to see his wisdom and to experience the great peace that God had brought to them through his servant David and the many battles that David had fought and people wanted to know all about Israel. But through some poor decisions and through poor leadership and in a direction away from God, Israel, the northern portion now of a divided kingdom, finds themselves in a bad spot. So difficult were the days that Elijah was in. For example, one man rebuilt the city Jericho. And there's a great explanation of this given. A city that had been cursed by God. That if anybody were to rebuild it, they would experience the loss of their firstborn and lastborn son. And one of the men of Israel did that. It was an act of defiance towards God. And really a lack of understanding of what God had done for them. And how he had brought Israel into the promised land and had push down the walls of Jericho that they might have that victory and have that land. It didn't take very long. 58 years of bad decisions and poor leadership and idolatry and now the people have followed suit and Elijah is stirred. Elijah desires for his people a revival. Elijah is a man who prayed according to the book of James. He prayed that God would be known amongst his people and so God used Elijah and his ministry to confront Ahab and to communicate his message that there would be no rain for the space of three years. And so for three years in Israel, rain and dew 
that was an evidence and a sign to them of God's blessing was withheld. And Israel begins to feel the pressure of this drought. Ahab himself is personally feeling that God will take Elijah through the school at the brook. And we studied that. He'll take him to the widow's house. And we considered that. And now God will call Elijah to go and confront Ahab. There'll be that tremendous battle on Mount Carmel where God will show himself strong and send fire that will consume the offering and the altar and all that's around it in a, just an unbelievable display for Israel. And Elijah will ask the question, how long halt you between two opinions? God will send rain. And then Jezebel, who was the queen in Israel, who was not from Israel, but was from a neighboring country, people who were enemies of God and people who had worked against Israel in the past who did not have Israel's best interest at heart and did not serve the living God. She brought with her her prophets of Baal and her prophets of the grove and she introduced the people there in a greater way to the worship of false gods. Ahab would experience a momentary revival, I think, of the rain coming and seeing what God would do. But as we considered last time we were together when he told Jezebel, Jezebel threatened Elijah's life and Elijah stepped out on his own and he began to run for the woods. God deals with him and God graciously calls him back through his tenderness and he calls him back to his mission. He tells him that there's a young man named Elisha and that there are a couple of kings that he will anoint who will complete the task. He also tells Elijah that there are not just one, but thousands of people in Israel who have not kissed and or bent their knee to Baal, that Elijah was not alone. Seemingly now, Elijah will go with Elisha and they'll begin to establish something called the School of the Prophets because it seems as if there's a seven-year time period where there's not much told about Elijah's life. We read in 1 Kings chapter 20 and we're given more insight into who Ahab is. Ahab is a wimp. Ahab is a sissy. Ahab is a punk. He's everything you can imagine a person who's not having courage and honorable before God. A wicked king comes up against him and gives demands, and Ahab willingly gives into those demands. When that enemy sees that Ahab rolls over so easy, he says, he asks for more. He finally gets to the point where Ahab consults the elders, some people who had sense, and they square him away and God will then miraculously give him victory two times over an enemy. And God will show again to Ahab who he is in his strength. Ahab saw God in several things. And that's important to note because as we conclude this chapter, we're going to see the demise of Ahab. But God revealed himself personally to Ahab in judgment. God revealed himself to Ahab personally in fire sent from heaven. In supply of rain. God revealed himself to Ahab in victory over his enemies. And God revealed himself to Ahab in the fulfilled word of God. And yet still, Ahab rejected God. May I interject at this moment this truth. God has revealed himself to us. God has revealed himself to us through creation. Even the heavens declare his handiwork. God has revealed himself through his word. God has revealed himself through the nation of Israel to us. God has revealed himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God has been displayed. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. God has displayed his love for us. This morning, God's word establishes his truth to us. God has shown us supply as the seasons continue as the rains come, as the crops grow, it's an evidence of God at work. We, as the people of America, have experienced providentially the victory of God. At times, against odds, where the enemy surely seemingly would have had the upper hand, God has given us victory. God gave us a leader by the name of George Washington, who led a ragtag group of soldiers against a well-trained world power, and God, through miraculous events, drove those enemies out, and God allow, allowed us to be established as an independent country. God gave us leaders who sought from the Word of God and took time for prayer with God and began to establish and did establish a nation that was established on Judeo principles, Bible principles. We have that. 
This is the connection that we have with Israel. It's more than that they are our ally. It's more than that they are the spearhead there in the Middle East. It's more than that they have oil. But they are to us as a nation with a spiritual understanding. We recognize the divine promise that God has when people are good to Israel. When people are a friend to Israel. As this world today spirals out of control and as people in our nation have been indoctrinated in falsehoods and lies, uh, they no longer see the purpose and the divine purpose of the America-Israel connection. We'll watch now as people are bombarding the streets and fighting and quarreling over it. It's a biblical principle that we should be a friend to Israel. Israel, this nation... God revealing himself to us through them. God's victories to us. God raising us up as a nation. God and his providence. World War II, America was not the America that you know today. We were not the world power. We were on our way. And there when we were attacked at Pearl Harbor, when men and those that have sat amongst us and those that were your parents, they raised up and they fought against armies and, and navies uh, that were highly trained and skilled in years of warfare. They gutted it out. They went to the islands and they hit the beaches. And they watched as their friends and those that were from their country fell and their bodies floating in the water. They fought up and down islands in the Pacific and climbed to the top. And we saw that picture a moment ago. To be able to plant a flag. They went through the frozen areas in Europe. And they drove back Hitler. They pushed him back to Berlin. They laid in trenches. In some cases, they froze to death. So that a world, a world could know freedom. We have seen God work. We have experienced the victory of God. We are watching as God's word is being fulfilled around us. All of that to say this. We, like Ahab, are without excuse. If you're here this morning and you have never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've never placed your faith in God's work of salvation, and that is that Jesus, God's Lamb, provided on our behalf, came to this earth and lived and died and was crucified and was buried and rose again on account of our sin, if you have never put your faith in Him, you're without excuse. You have experienced God. Those today who say there is no God, how foolish. This is the quote of the fool. The fool has said in his heart there is no God. God is everywhere. We have experienced God in so many ways. Today, no matter who you are, no matter what walk of life you come from, there is a God, the one and only God, and that one and only God has provided a way for you to be restored to him, has given to you eternal life through Jesus Christ. What must I do was the cry of the jailer who held the preachers in prison. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Have you believed on him? Regardless of your service to our country, regardless of your service to your family, there's a greater service that's the testimony that we can have of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and a life lived for him. If you've not believed, then you should. Ahab this king that we've described will return back from victories where God will have like once again established to him his willingness to help him as the leader of Israel. Naboth will retreat to a place in Jezreel. He notices one day, perhaps out of his window, as he's looking and he's counting all of his gold and he's considering his great estate, and he notices that there's somebody bordering his property who seemingly has a better piece of land than he has. And let me tell you about the natural man, the lustful man, always wants more. It wasn't enough that Naboth was king, or Ahab was king. It wasn't enough that Ahab was in possession of fine acres. He saw what another man had, and he said, I want that. Ahab left his palace, whether he rode his horse or walked to it, but it was close enough that he was walking there in his discussion with Naboth, and he said, hey, I'd sure like to have this. I'm willing to pay you top dollar for your land. If money is not what you want, then I'll trade you for another garden. Naboth responded. 
We know who Ahab is. He is the weak and wicked and whimpering king. Now Naboth strides onto the scene. Naboth, who is this Naboth? Naboth is a man who is bold and brave, obedient, one who honors God, and one who honors his fathers. Ahab says, let me buy it. Let me trade you for it. Verse 3, please, you have the response that we read a moment ago of Naboth. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Time will not allow, but I'll give you a couple of references to consider. Numbers chapter 36, verses 7 through 9, and Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 23. Naboth was not being dramatic when he said, The Lord forbid it. He was being literal. He was being biblical. He was being lawful. He said to the king, who was the one who was placed to enforce the law and to protect the law, he said, the Lord would forbid me to do that. He answered to a higher authority. His authority was higher than the king's. His authority was God. There comes a time in all of our lives when we must determine who it is that we seek to please who it is that we're willing to obey. We must choose to obey the Lord. We must recognize His Lordship in our life. He is more important. His law is more important. His directives in our life, His purposes in our life are more important than the pressures, than the whims of those around us. I fear the day, but I see it coming. We're in our culture. God's people will have to stand and stand strong in a sense against those who would seek to silence our voice when it comes to the word of God and the truth of God. We've experienced it already in a small scale. We've seen it when they have tried to pass laws that God's people could not gather. Bars and liquor stores could stay open, but they desired to shut the churches down. Certain states, they tried to outlaw believers from singing, fining them, taxing them. Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give thee the inheritance of my fathers. Not only did Naboth seek to obey God, but he sought to honor his fathers. We sang a few moments ago, Faith of our fathers. One of the ways the enemy has undermined our society is by tearing down the works of God and the heritage of our fathers. I recognize the issues. I recognize the shortcomings that you always have with men. Men are men at best. But I see something that God was able to accomplish through men, established through men. And we see the undermining and the deterioration of that. Naboth was a man who obeyed God, and he was a man who sought to honor his fathers. You see, God had commanded Israel in that land that was given as they entered into the promised land, that it was to be given by tribe and by family, and it was to remain with that family. It was God's land to give. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. There's only one who has a right to every square inch on planet earth. There's only one who has a right to every weed, every blade of grass, every bird that flies. There's only one who has a right to all things, and that's God. And God sets men up, and God takes men down, and God moves people out, and God moves people in. I don't always understand God's ways, but those are God's ways according to His purposes. And God who is the only one who can, said to a nation, I give to you, while you're here, this land. And every time Naboth's fathers walked on that land, they were to feel the soil. They were to plant in the soil. And they were to know something, that the God of heaven had given that to them. If for some reason they should lose it because of complications in life, God had even designated in the law that after a certain time period, it would be returned back to that family. God gave opportunity inside of that that somebody distant in that family could come and buy that property and buy that land. 
And so when Naboth said, the Lord forbid it, literally, he said, Ahab, you're asking me to do something that is against the command of our God. You're asking me to do something that my fathers have honored, and I won't do it. Naboth, bold, brave, obedient, honoring of God's law and honoring of his fathers. Ahab will return from this encounter. His response is to pout. His response is to go without eating. And let me say, there is no property worth going without a meal for. Amen. And he'll go home and throw himself down. This is the leader. This is the one that Israel is looking to. Indicative is Ahab of his times, of who he is. What a comparison. Naboth, bold, brave, and obedient to the very king. Naboth stood his ground. Ahab's wife comes in and asks, what's the problem? Why are you so sad? Naboth's response, or Ahab's response is, there's a Naboth who has got this land and he won't let me have it. And she asks him a question. Dost thou now govern, verse 7, the kingdom of Israel? Aren't you in charge? Can't you have what you want this is the cry of our society today is it not have what you want you deserve it take it if you want it if you want to think that you're a dog and bark and howl at the moon then you have every right to be a dog and bark and howl at the moon if you want to say that you're a cat and you want us to provide you with a litter box in your classroom because you're a furry? Real stuff, not making that up. You have every right. Because the natural man will never be satisfied. The natural man will never find enough. If you want his wife or this or that, take it. Aren't you the authority? You see... Ahab was not considering who he answered to, was he? What do you expect in the world today? With Ahab, we have to scratch our head and say, don't you see all that God has done? Don't you get this? But notice this. Not only is there the questioning of who are you and don't you have it within your right to do it? Notice what Jezebel says in conclusion. I will give thee. Who was really in charge? Who was really pulling the strings in the palace? Listen, when there is a lack of real, God-fearing, God-honoring leadership, there is the opening for all kinds of mischief, trouble, murder, mayhem. Oh, listen, I've got to close it. We come back tonight and we'll see what becomes of Naboth and Ahab and Jezebel. But I would call us to this consideration. As we consider our veterans today, these who have served, men and ladies, who've placed themselves in harm's way or have been willing to do so, bold, brave, obedient, honoring of the, in the case of a veteran, as you saw as they were swearing in the Constitution. Shouldn't we as believers be bold and brave and obedient and honoring of our God? An honoring of his word? Will we be like Ahab and throw ourselves around and take and look to have that which is not ours? Will we find a way to make it happen, which is what will take place with Jezebel, or will we yield to God's word? You don't want to live someplace where there is not a governance by God's law. Because God's law is absolute. God's law is truth. When we remove ourselves from truth, we are subject 
to the whims and the passions of those in charge. We need truth. That goes for governing and that goes for our lives. We must allow God's word to direct us. Let's pray. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Father in heaven, we come to you now. We've considered your servant Elijah. We've introduced Naboth. We've considered Ahab and who he is. Lord, may we be a people who are purposed to be like Naboth, to be bold, to be brave, to be obedient, to be honoring of God, to be honoring of God's law. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. It's a simple invitation this morning. If you're here this morning and you would say, Preacher, I do not know for sure if I were to die today that heaven would be my home. I do not know that I'm saved. We spoke of that halfway through, knowing Christ. My dear friend, today you're without excuse. There are people in this room who love you, who know Christ, who want you to know Christ. God's word proclaims it. Christ's resurrection puts the exclamation mark on it. There is no reason today for you to go to a devil's hell. Jesus Christ gave himself for you. It is for you and I to believe it. If you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. Please pray for me. I'd like to have that confidence, but I do not have that. I don't know that I'm saved. And on my way to heaven, would you lift your hand? You'd say, Preacher, please pray for me. I don't know that I'm saved. If you're here this morning and say, Pastor, I know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I know that I'm saved. Would you lift your hand? Preacher, I know the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I would not embarrass you for anything, but friend, if you could not raise your hand, please let one of us today whether it be an invitation or a conclusion of things today, let one of us share with you the greatest news you'll ever hear. Let Brother Wagner share with you today the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're a veteran today, there's nothing that you have seen that he's not seen. There's nothing that you've experienced that he's not experienced. Let him share the gospel with you today. Please, 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 don't leave this property today without at least receiving a gospel witness. If you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I want to be like Naboth, bold, brave, obedient, and honoring to God. That is my heart's desire. Would you lift your hand and say, Preacher, that's my desire. I want to be like Naboth, bold and brave and obedient and honoring to God. Father, help us to do just that. Here's our invitation now as we wrap things up. I believe today that our country is worth praying for. Could we today commit to corporate prayer right here for just a few moments? And praying for our nation, praying one that God would save our leaders. The Bible tells us and teaches us that we're to pray for kings and those that are in authority. We're to pray that they would be saved. Boy, people who know Christ and have the Spirit of God within them can then receive heavenly wisdom and heavenly instruction. Salvation is necessary. Can we pray for the salvation of our leaders? Can we pray this morning for the protection of our veterans? There are young men and ladies today who are in threatening positions. There are families even in our church who have loved ones who are on places where there is potential harm. Could we pray for our leaders? Could we pray for our veterans? And then, friend, could we pray for the churches in our country, that there would be an awakening in the hearts of God's people, that we would have a spirit not like Ahab, not like Jezebel, but a spirit like Naboth, bold, brave, obedient, Honoring to God, recognizing the great heritage that we have. This morning we'll just very simply have a time for prayer at the altar. If you can come to the altar to pray and you're comfortable with that, please do so. If you'd like to pray at your seat, make an altar out of your seat. But let's agree together here for just a few moments to pray for our country and these things that we've specified. Let's stand up for just a moment, can we please? As the pianist is playing, the altar is open to you. If you'd like to use the altar, please do so. If you'd prefer to make an altar out of your seat, you do that. We're praying for our leaders. We're praying for those today who are serving in the military. We're praying for our churches today.